presented on the continuation of what we presented the other day. Um, we, we cannot promise anything of what we're going to do in the future, but until today, this is what we've done. Uh, a framework to generate executables in Windows, a just in time compiler that plugs very well to uh, dynamic message dispatching. Algorithm um, to implement the GC. We of course have to implement the object format, um, the ability to create and duplicate objects, uh, a few primitives. But we've not done anything about other aspects of the VM. So we are not very close to the time of the VM. <coughs> that we want to have a complete VM, but it's just a plan, and plans can go wrong. But we keep trying. Why? Well, it doesn't really have to be a VM, but we want a, an environment where we can execute phone. Yes, I don't really know what a VM is. Uh, talking to people here, apparently the specific differentiator to say if anything's a VM or not, it's a lookup mechanism. If there is a lookup, apparently, like, if, if, uh, if, if it has a lookup mechanism, then there is a VM. Well, we just run an execution environment. You, you, you will agree, Mark, because uh, here in your questions, that was the concept you were pondering. I think, I think. Yes, 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 always. No, we should want to have a complete execution environment for small. We, we don't care if it's a VM. Yeah. And here we're going to pretend what we've done after we had uh, the GC work. So we worked on a few optimizations to see how far we could, how, how much faster we could do it without changing much. Uh, then we thought, okay, but now if I have a GC, I, I can instrument it and collect the statistics and then maybe do something else later. But then, something that we wanted to try is to implement different GC algorithms and see how they affect, how far they are from the other algorithms we presented and we implemented and how they affect performance or memory instance. So, the, the few optimizations we want to talk about is uh, more and more big inline cache and link sense, especially uh, other privileges and how we inline them during compilation, just in time compilation or translation. Um, we replaced a few privileges in the system with our own, and then we've done a few more, but we're not going to talk about them. The, the, in, the performance impact of most of the things we tried was completely negative. So the first one is link sense. This is how we solve message dispatching in our system. Uh, up there, up here, that's the entry point to a particular message. There is one case uh, where this is is name, for example, right? One case for the small integer, small integer case. Then if it's not, then we compute the class type of the object, let me say, and then we have an implementation for each particular type. And then we don't plan the hierarchy in our pick, we loop, we compute the superclass of the receiver and loop back again to the entry point. This is the difference to the other picks, because if we are collecting all the code we want to have and freezing it into the dealer, that would mean that if we flatten the hierarchy, we would have every method or object in every class. And we don't want that. That makes it very slow. So we pay a little bit the price, a, a, a little price for not flattening the hierarchy in terms of speed, but we gain a lot in space. And we also gain in speed because of locality. So the loss is not so clear. We are very happy with this. 
Um, so listens means that uh, the first time when a message is sending, when a compartment is sending a message, yes. So this is the call side, right? No, no, this is, you could think this is the product to one, uh, okay, our process code has one entry for each selector. So this is call side? No, it's not, the call side is where the call is. Yes. The call is not here. This is the message set. This is the function for a message set. This is where you shop when you, when you want to make a call, okay? Is the entry point for one particular selector? Okay, it's the call side, but it's not the call side. I think it's not the call side. The call side is where the call is. Where the call, the caller. What? Is it, is it, it could be, you could think it's a product to the native method. But there are many implementations, so it's not one particular native method. Yes. Right. What I understand, uh, Richie, in this model is that in the DSC runtime as I understand it, uh, you know, a method can have a uh, hit prepended to it saying, okay, I have a function for these classes, and then if, um, if you fall off that hit, you don't find that in this point, then you go up in, in, in the hierarchy. So, but um, is there any conceptual problem to do with, with, with uh, siblings? Well, no. Let me answer all the questions, all the five questions you place in that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but first, I think I may be able to clear up your question here, which is, if I understand you correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, every send site that sends the same particular selector so shares one of these. Uh -huh. yeah, okay. Right, right, thank you. Uh, actually, there's one core in the library. Here. Right. There, there's a sport symbol from the DLL that we create for each selector. And uh, this is here. This is it. You could call it from C. Well, not one. You would want, but you could. Okay, and then going back to earlier, this has nothing to do with VSC implementation. This is completely different. VSC does not have feet. They only have monomorphic inline caches on these cells. But they don't, they don't do any kind of feet. It's different. Okay, and. Uh, uh, regarding siblings, the siblings would be just uh, more steps down. They're not, this is not laid out in a tree, it's all linear steps. So have you, have you right, have you, have you thought of, of Yes, we, we, we have. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, the tree would be, if you have processing code, the addresses are fixed, so you could do a binary search right. on the address, and that flattens the depth. But we haven't tried. So you need it quite bad. Right. Big, right? What what did big do you know? benefit there? Yeah. Uh, well after we sense uh, there is no 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 much need of doing optimization in the So okay, so let's go to the to what you said. The the optimization we've made is that the, after the first time you enter this code and one particular class matches the call side is patched to point to the exact implementation for that particular class. That's a monomorphic inline cache, as far as I understand. And um, so the next time the caller is executed, the call will be direct to that particular implementation, which has a type check in the product to fail back to the full uh, peak whenever it fails, right? And, and then the second time it's going to patch again the call side to the proper implementation. Um, for our code where only parts of, of it are polymorphic, this show a very small performance thing, but I don't know the numbers. Uh, less than 5%, I think. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, how, how do we implement that? This is the original code that renders one particular champ for one class, like for this class, render the champ to this particular compile method. Uh, render is uh, creating the assembly in our terminology. So um, it compares 
the, temp the temporary register where we have the type. I've said type because we don't use class. Okay, we use the method dictionary right on this. So we have the type in temporary compared to constant that the method dictionary of the class we want to render. And since this can move, we tell the framework to to register an absolute reference. This is a relocation in the DLL. Okay. So the DLL will have a relocation for each pointer because the DLL can be loaded anywhere in memory. And then if it's equal, we shall save the save the label. What? Where is it? Ah, I removed it. Well, I don't know. But then uh -huh. <coughs> ah, okay, we shall to the to the entry part of the compile method where we have an export with the full name, fully qualified name is the class and the selector. So if it's a class we shall to the entry part of the method. The the mod modification is we want before jumping we want to patch the call side. That's what we want to do. So we invert the call and skip some code. Uh, we invert the shunt. It says if equal and it's if not equal, so we can do stuff in the middle. And in this case we need the model more picking line cache to that patches the call side. And I, I don't really want to spend much time explaining the details, but this is how our so you have an idea of how our code is. And it's a little bit more complex uh, because in the case of the superclass, when the superclass match, we don't want to patch the column. We don't want to patch a call set if it's a super. Uh, it's a hierarchy, no? It's a super. It's a super. If it's a sense super, we don't want to patch a call set because it's always not fair the class check because uh, the class of the receiver is not the class of the implementation, right? So. Um, I'm going to skip that and I'm going to just show it to you in the debugger how it looks. Okay. 
So we can do this. So 
On entry, we previously had to change the class of all the objects in one to seven S to two, and then restore the classes on exit. But by sending under primitive, you have to not do any class check, which is the patch the under primitive, and don't need to change anything. That's in the part of the code. So then, uh, we, we started uh, changing a little bit the GC to collect statistics, but this is not trivial. Uh, yesterday, or on Wednesday, we've shown how we can modify the market contract to add an instant variable to it, um, count how many objects the collect sees. Remember that? There, there was a small line there. I mean, it, it, it's true, it was working, um, but th there is a small line. Uh, because what I just said, we cannot really send messages to objects outside the closure from within the closure, and we cannot send messages from the closure from outside the closure. So if I'm collecting statistics and I want to publish the results to the outside world, this publishing has to do something to the objects so they can be uh, used from outside the closure. Okay, it has to send the special classes and stuff. So the first uh, and most simple thing we 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 try that, that we have, we use a lot for our tests is that we we have proxies that can that can wrap every message in a, in an object inside the closure around the logic so the message can be sent from outside. Okay, so I can wrap the GC that's in the closure and send messages to it in a proxy. We use that in the test a lot. But then we use that um, for the collecting the stats. Remember, I sh I've shown you how to change the count that, that I, I, I added an instance variable here and then I added an accessor. We spell count in the name. Uh, well, the, the, we we got it. We got it all prepared, so it was easy to do, right? But in in the back, there is more things going on. Like in the builder, there is there, the the object I was inspecting was not the GC because I could because the GC is in the cache. So if I send inspect to it, the system crashes. So the object I was inspecting is the builder. The builder created the DLL, loaded the DLL. We plug the GC into the post VM. Um, so the count here will create a proxy around uh, the method count, count and at the end send it to the receiver. It, it, it uh, gets the DLL and queries the address of that particular method and then install the compile method with that binary code in the DLL and send a message. But this message cannot have any receiver because if I give a receiver this message, the closure, the code in the closure will not know what to do with it because it will have a class that is only understandable outside the closure. So for that what we do is we implement what we call kind of gateways that re-dispatch the message to the single point. And this code is executed already inside the closure. So now the selector, the receiver is correct. It's, uh, it's the single point for the GC and can understand everything. Okay? So this is all the logic behind it. And let me show you a little bit more. I was uh, wishing to do to show you more examples, but I, I'm going to leave them for for the end if we have time. Uh, but if, for example, this is a trick we have to do if we want the statistics to return an array. The array will live in the closure, and I want to export it. So what we do is we add in the GC a method that takes any array. Any because we're just going to take a class from it and copy it. We just need the arise class, okay? And then 
when we want to return something, we we get the information of the host page from the host VM. We shallow copy the statistics, the stats arrive to the answer. We change the class of the answer to the class of the arrived and using as a template to have the external the external class and then well mark it as unseen because uh, the garbage the garbage tracks this environment that every object is in an unseen state naturally an answer. So to export something I need to copy to the old space. That's what I need to do. And I need to set this class to something that's understandable from the old time world. And uh, to go a little bit farther, because we wanted to do many of these tests and we didn't want to do this every time, we created a small framework for this, where we have a, a harvester and an analyzer for these statistics. Uh, the harvester lives inside the closure and knows how to export stuff. So uh, there is shared memory space between the closure and the external words that we create in a virtual, in, in a new memory segment, we can say. Okay, and so we created this framework where we can talk from, from the closure to the harvester, where it has its own space for storing results. We, we, Yes, we, we, we actually add it to the kosher, to all the code that we're going to generate, we put it into the kosher, along with all the other classes that are part of the GC. And then we can collect the statistics and, and get them from the old time world. It's a little bit complex, and it, it's complex because there are two words that are linked together. The closure that is not supposed to happen in the external world, and the external world that wants to get results from the closure. So we need to do something explicitly to support the results. Yeah, but it's not that it looks complex, but um, it's not that complex, actually. No, it's. Uh, you, we understand why we need to do it for every single step. I mean, it has to do with this, that the. The dispatching of the messages inside and outside of the closure system. So, one of the first statistics that uh, we collected um, is a uh, some metabolic test or coefficient. Uh, we, we want to know uh, which amount of the old space is actually moved. So the stability is like a proxy for the stability. If we have a really, well, we are not measuring the amount moved, but the amount not moved. So if we have a really large number there, it means that probably the, um, the garbage collector was not necessary. Um, well, we want to know the address of the first object move. And we want to know the size of the old space at the end. Well, the harvester has to gather that information in the array. And also we want to know about the maximum graph depth in the object graph. Yes. So we're collecting two numbers. Okay. The stability index and the graph depth. Uh, well, the numbers are those. Um, most of the time, the garbage collector is run. The stability is almost one. So it means nothing is moved. It's 99.98, 99.97 percent. Like nothing is moved when it puts it in front. It means you shouldn't have left, right? Yeah, we are and following all the time. We are following all the objects and there is no movement. Uh, this is interesting because uh, we are moving in between two different sets of graph pairs, so we want to analyze that. But it, it was interesting that having only two numbers, 
we found yeah, we have no theory for that. It, the graph there is apparently around uh, 50,000, 50 or 4,900. 40, 40, it's like nothing in the It's like, what's going on? Well, then we did some alternative with machine. Yes. Um, we have is, can this be used for teaching, learning, to see how much of this can be uh, abused if you want to try different ideas, right? We are trying to do a framework. So, uh, we, we sit down to implement a few other pieces. Uh, pieces. Uh, we're going to talk about just three.
So that, that stack is an object that is living inside the garbage collection. Right. Right. Yes. So the stack and the queue are objects living in the right. in the so and, and what happens if Ray Ritchie says it uses up the memory? Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 It does. What? What problems? Stack. Yes, it's stack. Yeah, well, the stack is frozen, but it has some VM array, which is in a local space that may be grown. We have an arena that is allocated and created especially for temporary use by the GC and its own separate memory space. Um, objects there live and are objects that understand the message of growth that we invented. So they go. And the goes out and goes through. Right. So this is the difference between these three algorithms. This is the only method that changes. And it's very clear to see the difference between breadth first and the depth first. Right? Yes. And maybe speaking out in terms of something, we can come back to it, but the, the neat thing about uh, Angus Scavenger is that by copying the other same space and then taking the point that there's a two space where we are. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one we're going to show is what Elliot was asking about. Um, and the difference between breadth and the others and chain is this. Let me repeat. Hmm. Most of the code goes away. Well, okay. and there is some code. Okay? In yeah, it's uh, in, in a paper by chain and then something. Uh, but of course, there is no recursion there, and we're walking the graph, graph, so there must be some other trick. And there is no trick. The trick is that we use the other spaces to maintain the queue of objects to still be seen. Okay? So we have the remember set with lots of references to objects in the young space. The front and two are the two smart spaces in our lingo. Uh, so, in this case, four objects are referenced from the remember set, and they have references to other objects. So, the first pass copies these four objects to either the other semi space or the old space, depending on the generation in our implementation. So, some go to the old space, some go to the two space. These objects that we've just copied have references to other objects in the young space. So what we do is we, we start with, this is called the two fingers algorithm because you use two fingers to point the beginning and the end of what you need to scan. So after copying the first object, we, we move, we, we know that we still have to scan these two new objects. So we scan one from one finger to the other, copying all the referred objects to these other spaces and repeat until <coughs> there's nothing else to scan in this piece of my space. So this is a generational scavenger that does not use any other memory. And it's fast. Right? fast yeah. So it doesn't use more space and it's fast. So it's going to So it, it, it means so if we organize the objects by covering the references, that's what you're saying? No, no. The, Yes, it does. Well, well, yes. It can reorder, yes. Yes, yes. It, it, it is going to reorder, yes. In fact, it does. So it poses an order. That's good. It, it is good. It is good. It, it, uh, it localizes the... Well, it depends whether it's in the cache or not. Right. Well, right. 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 actually, you know, Yeah. Different objects 
So one type of object that has spread first and not Yeah, I'm really sure that you want to do something. Uh, so we don't read your this, but this was all invented in 1960. Oh, yes. 1960. Yes, yes. Maybe we would write an access. Yeah. Right. So now it's more like this. Yeah. Yeah. They trace people who spent years you know, figuring out how to write stuff on the disk to minimize heat. It's just the same in memory now. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yes. Absolutely. So we live into some experts, by the way. No, but there is a frame for planning with this. Um, so the algorithm will do everything that the other algorithms did like follow the roots, follow the stack, but after doing anything, it will have to go and in a tight loop, scan the two space and scan the old space until the two fingers get together. That's step one. There is no recursion, the recursion is flattened in this loop. Okay. This loop. Um, if you want to see it, this is the two finger thing. Uh, I see I reach the end of the space. I get an object. This is the header. This is the center side of the center object. Um, and I go to the next object. And here it says follow the object. This follow will actually follow the object and copy it to the other to the space. Uh, we are approaching the end. What do we expect to do next? We're going to follow by finishing the JIT. The JIT does work now, but we have not computed the closure for it, so it's not uh, self-contained in the DLL. So that's the next thing we're going to do. We're going to implement the debugging features that are still missing in the JIT. So you can debug the code that's not devised with this JIT. Uh, we're going to continue implementing more primitives. And publish a page that we're working on for some time. And uh, compute uh, and build the system with R gates and R Calculators and some primitives and start building something that's where everything's going to grow. Yeah, and to be touched from the top here. Yes, to do so we can. Um, <laughs> until the end of your questions, we're done. <laughs>